about it and <coughs> thought it might be a good idea for me to maybe uh, go into my Serenity New Testament and share it with you just a little bit because uh, so many times we, when we think about the steps and we think about recovery, we're always thinking about primarily drugs and alcohol. That's kind of, and I think I've touched on it a little bit in the past and said, it, you know, working the steps is for anybody. You don't have to have a drug and alcohol problem to work the steps. Some of us are, have issues with other things. And so today I thought I'd take a couple of minutes anyways um, to share with you a little bit of that. Because you, you find this in the Serenity New Testament. Hopefully uh, you had a chance to read some of these things at some point. But, and, and here's what it says. Uh, we embark on recovery as a means of seeking freedom from any one or more, any one or more of a number of addictive agents. Addictive agents are those persons or things on which we form an excessive dependency. And the catalog of addictive agents <laughs> includes this. And I'm going to read you this because, you know, if the issue you're struggling with in your life is, is a dependency on drugs and alcohol, I mean, that's, you know, pretty clear about what you're doing. But there's a whole lot of other addictive agents that we got to deal with. And some of us, it's on a drugs and alcohol. Some of us find ourselves in one of these other, uh, dealing with one of these other agents. So alcohol, drugs is one. Work, achievement, and success. Some people just can't let, you know, they just, they're just, they, they're just pushing, pushing, pushing themselves. Sometimes, and, and remember, as we talk about some of these, as I share with you, these eight, these addictive agents, it's when it begins to create a problem in your life. It begins to create problems in relationships, problems with your, uh, you know, family members, things that where, where work, achievement, and a success mean so much, and you're so dependent on it, that you fail to take care of the other relationships in your life. Money addictions, overspending. Nobody has that addiction. <laughs> overspending, gambling, hoarding. I can't tell you how many times that I've seen over my years of, of, of working in this field, um, and I've worked in so many different uh, levels from case manager, to counseling and so forth. I mean, there's times I've had to go to people's homes, and I'll tell you what, it, when you walk into somebody's house who's a hoarder, yes. oh my gosh. I mean, you barely have a path to walk through because there's so much stuff inside your home. They just cannot get rid of anything. They just, they, they purchase it or they acquire it somehow, and they can't get rid of it, hoard it. You never think about that being a, an issue that you've got to work 12-step program over, but these are the addictive agents where people need a 12-step program to help them overcome. Control addictions. Nobody has a control addiction. Right? You, just, you don't really have to be in control or anything, do you? <laughs> control addictions. Food addiction. Sexual addictions. Approval dependency, the need to please people. I don't know if any of you here know people like that. I mean, they just, they can't seem to overcome. You know, they've always got to make, they're always trying to please somebody. And it, and it creates problems in their life. Rescuing patterns towards other persons. So people who just, you know, they got to rescue you. You know, you got a problem, they got to come to the rescue. They got to be there. And sometimes, again, um, by the fact that they're even doing that, sometimes hurts the re person needing rescue or appears to needing rescue and then it does in helping them. Dependency on toxic relationships. Relationships that are damaging and hurting. Oh my gosh. I, there's a lot you can say about that but how many times, and you may be sitting here, maybe you're, you're sitting here and going, Man, that, that's me. You get involved with somebody, it, they abuse you, they hurt you, whatever. You get out of that relationship. Well, of course, it takes you a long time to get out of it. Then you get out of it, and guess what? 
He walked right back into another one. Same thing. Dependency on toxic relationships. Physical illness such as hypochondria, always something physically wrong. I do know somebody like that. And there's never, ever, will I ever talk to this person that there isn't something physically wrong with that person and take them to the doctor, nothing wrong. Can't find anything wrong. Although that person is absolutely sure there's something wrong, we can't find anything wrong. No matter what, she always has something wrong. Exercise and physical conditioning. You know anybody that just, man, they just can't let it go. They just, man, they're pumping in there, they're in the exercise room. They, they skip work, they don't go to their job, they're not taking care of their responsibilities. Cosmetic clothes, cosmetic surgery, trying to look good on the outside. It could be an addiction. You know, it needs to be, there needs to be balance. Academic pursuits, excessive intellectualizing. Religiosity or religious legalism. Preoccupation with the form and the rules and regulations of religion rather than benefiting from the real spiritual message. And there's more. General perfectionism. I know somebody like that as well. You might know somebody in perfection. They, everything has to be absolutely perfect. And it absolutely drives me crazy. <laughs> Cleaning and avoiding contamination and other obsessive compulsive symptoms. Organizing, structuring, the need to always have everything in its place. And materialism, always going to have to acquire something. So I'm just going to read a little bit further. It says, most of us can see ourselves somewhere in this list. And all of us can benefit from the truths that emerge from 12-step recovery because all of us are to some degree, codependent. And what does this mean? We define codependency as being a, the, an effort to control interior feelings by manipulating people, things, and events on the outside. So you get that? It's like the, you know, where I feel bad, so you have to change. Because if you change, I'll feel better. It doesn't work like that. People don't change simply to make you feel better. So this is a whole list of these things, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything like that, but I'm sure you, some of you have seen not only one or two, maybe there's several things that I've read that you sit there and you're thinking like, me. Maybe you heard you see yourself in this list. And what happens is this. Jesus talks about light. And I'm going to just go, go through this real quick. And it's in the, uh, gospel, in the gospel of Mark. Back to the same chapter we were talking about where Jesus talks about the, the, uh, the sower who went out to sow and he sowed the seeds. Well, right after he talks about that parable, uh, it's in verse 21, or uh, verse 20, and it says this, for, the, for there is nothing hidden, oh, let me start with verse 21, or 20, but these are the ones sown, uh, sown on good ground who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 34, some 60, some 100. So this was a parable Jesus taught about soil, different kinds of soil. Seeds get planted. Some soil, you know, good soil produces what I just read. Some soil, hard, can't get in there, can't, can't grow. Some seed falls on the wayside, birds eat it. 
you know, and some seed falls among thorns where it grows, but the thorns grow up with it and choke it where it can't produce. So this very last part of this, Jesus says this. But these, those who, and the, the seed that falls in the good soil, but these are the ones sown on good ground, those who, there's three things here. Hear the word, accept the word, and then bear fruit <laughs> and be productive and produce. And so some of you here, you know, heard the word. Now, I've, I've read to you a bunch of things in here that says about why we need 12 step work. Um, and the light may have come on in your mind that says, my guys, that's me. The light has come. And so the next part of what Jesus is teaching here in Mark chapter 3 says to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that it should not come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus brings light. You accept that light, and then you don't do anything about it. <laughs> you put it under a bowl. You put it under a bed. You, it doesn't do you any good. To hear it, to accept it, but to do nothing about it does you no good. So when I read something like this, when, you, when I read this list of addictive agents that we find ourselves engaged in sometimes, um, you know, like light bulbs go off inside your head and you go, my gosh, you know, that's me. But if you don't do anything about it, not only does it do you any good, then of course it doesn't do anybody else any good either. But when you hear it, accept it, and then be productive in your life, remember what step 12 says, as a result, as, as a, a, you know, the, the uh, oh my gosh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Because as you accept the light and as you begin to do something about it, people will see it. It gives light to others. They, they get to see change and transformation. And you know what that does for others? It gives them hope. When I see in your life how God is transforming and changing you, it gives me hope. It gives other people hope that, my gosh, if he can do it for you, certainly he can do it for me. And that's why we share our stories. That's why we tell our, you know, we let people know how God has, what he's done in our lives, how he's come in and changed us. Because it brings hope to others. You sit in these chapel services, and I know that many of you have heard so many stories and things over the years of, of people's lives being one way, and then all of a sudden they're totally different. You probably know people like that. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who said, man, I knew that Bush back in then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right there's one back in the back he knew Doug Bush back when. And of course, Doug knew Steve Bush back when too. <laughs> no, no. He didn't know me that way. Oh, he didn't know you that way. Okay. <laughs> but there's, a, there's something different. People who, had, who knew me from years ago would not, could not believe where I'm at today. People who knew Doug from years ago can't believe where he's at today. Because change has happened. Recovery, remember what we always talk about, recovery isn't just stop doing things. It's, it's change plus abstinence. Change plus abstinence equals recovery. 
You know, when somebody is abstaining but they're not actually recovering, you know, we call them dry drunk or whatever, you know, they still have all the behaviors of, 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 of being an alcoholic, but, but just not drinking at the moment. Change plus abstinence, that's what recovery is all about. And so when I read to you all these addictive agents that people get caught up in, and, you know, um, and then they don't do anything about it. They just continue on and their life be, is, I guess sometimes people just think that they, they just accept it for what it is. You know what? I'm, I'm an addict when it comes to one of these things and that's just it. But that's not the way God wants you to live. God has such a full and abundant life for you. One that's full of joy and peace and happiness. In the midst of storms, you can have peace. That's what he wants for you. And that's what he wants for me. But we have to take these steps. Just as we see it in here, the ones Sown, the, the seed that's sown on good soil, hear the word, accept the word, and bear fruit as a result of the word. It will grow up, and, and your life will become productive. And productive in, in, in what, the way God wants you to be productive. That's what this is all about. What God wants to do in your life. All right. So, if you're here today and you heard something in one of those things that I've read to you and you're saying, Dean, you know what, that's me, um, I would encourage you uh, to find yourself a nice 12-step group meeting or pick up a Serenity New Testament like I have here and start working these steps in relation to whatever it is that God revealed to you, whatever light he gave you regarding whatever it is in your life that you're dependent on that's causing you problems, causing you, step one, admitting that our, that our lives, that, you know, um, we admitted we are powerless over whatever that is, and you can name it in there, and that our lives become unmanageable. Can you imagine a hoarder saying, you know what, I admit that I am powerless over hoarding, and as a result, my life became unmanageable? Absolutely. Even though there may be in denial all the way up to this point, saying, no, it doesn't really, it's not really a problem, it's not really an issue for me. And that's called denial. People live in denial all the time. God brings light brings, you know, uh, reveals to them what they need to do, and they walk away from it because they're in denial. They don't want to hear it. Sometimes it causes them to feel guilty or shame, and they don't want to deal with that, so they don't deal with whatever the issue of the problem is. But God wants you to have a good, abundant life, a good life. Not one that's all wrapped up in just pursuit of whatever. Where, where it damages your relationships with others and hurts you. It's not what God wants. He wants you to be free.